talking through the picture. I've drawn some type of cubic function here. Okay, that's not really that significant. But <clears throat> we have modified the limit definition of the derivative. Now, what's going to happen is when we use this limit definition of the derivative, what we are going to find is we are going to find the value of the derivative at a particular point. No longer are we just finding the derivative function that will give us the value at any point. We are finding the value of the derivative at a specific point. So it's just kind of streamlining the process a little bit. First of all, with that limit definition as is, if we just plugged in a, we would get f of a minus f of a, which is zero, over a minus a, which is zero. So we know that when we get zero over zero, we need to do some kind of manipulation. We'll look at that here in a second. But let me show you on a picture what we're talking about. So let's say, for example, we want to find the slope of the tangent line at this point right here. We're calling it A. We want to find the slope of the tangent line, a.k.a. the instantaneous rate of, rate of change, a.k.a. the derivative. Those three terms need to be completely synonymous in your head. So what's happening is it's saying, this is going back to still that same idea of uh, the secant lines. Okay, Say we pick some x value right here, Okay, and we drew f of x minus f of a over x minus a is the slope of that secant line. Okay, so what this limit definition is saying is as x gets closer to a, okay, so if I pick a different x value that's closer to a, let's call it x sub 1, and plot at its point, it's closer to a, it's the slope of that secant line is a little different, and really that's not very accurate, but I was trying to exaggerate it um, for you to see that there's a difference. There's a difference between the first slope that I drew and the second slope that I drew. Um, and as that x value gets closer to the value in question, this a, um, then that secant line is going to be closer and closer and closer to the tangent line, which is or we also know it as the derivative, okay? So that's what this limit definition is calculating for us. So let's look at an example, okay? Um, I wouldn't necessarily write out this entire sentence of instructions, just say find the average rate of change um, and then the instantaneous rate of change at the endpoints. Okay, average rate of change. When we see the words average rate of change, what did I tell you you need to think? Slope. Okay, average rate of change is simply the slope. That's what you should think automatically in your head when you're asked to find the average rate of change. You should think slope. I'm finding the slope between two points. Then when you see the words instantaneous rate of change, you should think derivative at a point. Okay, so if our function here, we've got a square root function, the square root of 4x minus 7, and our interval is from 5 to 11 halves. 11 halves is what, 5.5? So a pretty short interval. We're going from 5 to 5.5. Let's start with the average rate of change. Okay, that is the slope. Um, and we can abbreviate it AROC. Okay, average rate of change. We want to do x1, x2, a, b, however you want to do it, it really doesn't matter, um, but you plug in the numbers, so we've got the square root of 4 times 11 halves minus 7 minus the square root of 4 times 5 minus 7 all over 11 halves minus 5. Average rate of change is simply our slope. Now, 4 times 11 halves is 22. Okay, the 4 over the 2 simplifies to 2. 2 times 11 is 22. So we've got uh, 22 minus 7, what, 15? Minus uh, 20 minus 7 is 13 over 1 half. 
random house is 5.5, so we've got one half on the bottom. Now, unfortunately, those are not nice, pretty, perfect squares, so we're going to have to use, well, I'm going to use my calculator, okay? Um, all I did was we were dividing by one half, so flip and multiply by the reciprocal, that's two times the square root of 15 minus the square root of 13, and no, that is not equivalent to the square root of 2. Okay, remember when we did radicals, you cannot combine radicals unless uh, they are the same number under the square root. Okay, uh, multiply that by 2. So the average rate of change for this function over this interval is approximately 0.534. Yes, I realize that that 8 rounds up the 4, uh, but <clears throat> anytime on the AP exam, you truncate, okay? You write the first three numbers after the decimal and then you just stop writing. Don't worry about rounding, okay? They will count off if you round incorrectly, so just write the first three numbers after the decimal place, okay? At least. Technically, you can write more, but that's all that they require. All right, so that is the average rate of change over this interval. If we picked a different interval, it'd be a different number, okay? We're good with that. Yes? It's just y2 minus y1. Well, hang on, let me write it like this. Average rate of change is f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. So it's our slope formula. Yes, those are the x values. I'm sorry? That's the y value. I plugged it into the function. So those are y values. Okay, then it asked for the instantaneous rate of change at the extreme values of the given interval. So that's at the endpoints of the interval. So let's find f prime of 5, first of all. Okay, let's start with the nice whole number. Okay, we are finding the limit as x approaches 5 of f of x, square root of 4x minus 7, minus f of 5. Well, we found out in the previous problem that that was the square root of 13. Over x minus 5. That's just coming directly from our limit definition that we just wrote down for the uh, derivative at a point f of x minus f of a over x minus a, a being 5 in this case. Now, if we plug in 5 right here, we're going to get 0 over 0. So what do we have to do when we've got um, these radicals? We've got to multiply by the conjugate. Okay. Uh, obviously, I don't have room to show that. But what's going to happen in the top? <coughs> The square roots are going to cancel, and we're going to have 4x minus 7 minus 13 over x minus 5 times the square root of 4x minus 7 plus the square root of 13. Remember, we don't multiply that out. We leave it as it is. We need to do some simplifying. And I'm going to combine two steps right here just to save some space. Uh, on the top, negative 7 minus 13 is negative 20. So we have 4x minus 20. Well, we're used to that canceling with what's in the bottom, but it's not exactly what we have in the bottom because we can uh, factor out a 4. Okay, so 4x minus 7 minus 13 is equivalent to 4x minus 20, and then I factor out a 4, so that's 4 times x minus 5. Now, we can cancel those x minus 5s, and our problem is gone. 
Okay, if the issue that we had before is gone, now we are going to be able to plug in uh, 5, and I'm going to go ahead and do that. We've got 4 over the square root of, uh, well, 4 times 5 is 20, minus 7 is 13. So we've got the square root of 13 plus the square root of 13, that's 2 square roots of 13. And 4 over 2 is 2. So we've got 2 over the square root of 13. That's the exact value. I would like to compare it to the average rate of change. So I'm going to um, see what the calculator says the equivalent decimal value is. And it is approximately 0.554. So pretty close. Two one hundredths um, difference. <clears throat> because 5 is my A, it's the point that I'm wanting to find the, um, the derivative of a point A can be found, so I put in 5 for both those A's. The point that you're trying to find the derivative of is A. So you plug it into the limit definition everywhere you see A. I just haven't done it yet. Okay, um, so just for practice, okay, I want you all to 